Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will begin. Uh, my name is Edward Byrne, the principal here at King's, and can I welcome such a distinguished audience for what is a truly marvelous occasion. So welcome to King's for this historical event. Uh, this is a first for King's and a first for the discipline of psychiatry. Receiving the title of Regis Professor is a truly rare honor. Uh, it is designed to reflect an exceptionally high standard of teaching and research at an institution. The award, of course, is to the institution. Only 26 Regis professorships have been granted since the reign of Queen Victoria, and King's is honored to be awarded the first Regis for King's and the first for psychiatry. To confer this honor, I would like to introduce Sir Christopher Geit, Chairman of King's College London Council. Sir Christopher. Uh, Principal, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm delighted to be here today on this really extraordinary occasion, and uh, I'll explain why it is. But before I do so, I just mention that um, the Queen, patron of King's, um, gave lunch this afternoon to the very illustrious members of the Order of Merit. One of those um, very small and select group is uh, Sir Michael Howard, who um, uh, is probably the nation's most distinguished uh, military historian, who was a pioneer of developing his field here at King's uh, in what is now war studies in the 1960s. And in, in the course of lunch, uh, he is now uh, a sprightly 94 years old, by the way. Uh, in the course of lunch, he paused and he said, well, these are my reflections on King's. King's is living proof that a world-leading, illustrious university can be found in the heart of London. And in a sense, it is to garner that extraordinary profile and indeed reputation that brings us here today. I'm a former student, now a fellow and a chairman of King's, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here today to inaugurate this Regis Professorship of Psychiatry. And I think most pleasurably of all to salute uh, its incumbent, Sir Simon Wesley, because this really is an extraordinary distinction, as the principal has said, and one which resides most deservedly here at King's. They are very rare beasts, Regis professorships. That King's has come to be in a position to be granted one is a very signal honour and a very signal mark of distinction both for the university and for the chair itself. This award, of course, also reflects the, the special relationship between the IOPPN and the Maudsley. And while noting that the strategic vision that we have published uh, recently for 2029 gives encouragement to the activity of this institute and indeed to all it can contribute to addressing mental health needs, it gives me great pleasure now to invite Dr. Patrick Lehman, the Executive Dean, and Professor Matthew Patrick, the Chief Executive Officer of South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust, formally to unveil the Royal Warrant. Thank you very much.
Uh, it is now my privilege to introduce uh, the first incumbent uh, of the Regis Chair in Psychiatry. Sir Simon has, of course, a tremendous uh, and distinguished career in psychiatry uh, with a great international research reputation. Sir Christopher referenced the special relationship between the IOPPN and the Maudsley. It is at the Maudsley that Sir Simon trained as a psychiatrist. It is there, nearly 30 years later, that he continues to motivate and to inspire the next generation of psychiatrists. Sir Simon has the extraordinary achievement of over 700 original publications and a number of books, um, of which he very humbly says uh, that they're not, not bestsellers. I don't know if that's quite true. <laughs> it is. <laughs> his commitment to education and research is matched by his commitment to public engagement in science in person and through the media uh, as a voice for his discipline. Uh, uh, he's been incredibly effective in that in recent times. Uh, Sir Simon is nearing the end of his tenure as president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, but not one to rest on his laurels. He is president-elect of the Royal Society of Medicine. For his inaugural lecture, Simon has cited the recent rise in mental disorders in young people as perhaps the first true uh, uh, rise in psychiatric disorders in this country in several generations. To explore this important topic, it is my great pleasure to invite one of the most outstanding psychiatrists of his generation, the inaugural Regis Professor of Psychiatry in King's College London, Professor Sir Simon Wesley. Thank you, everybody. I'm not at all nervous. <laughs> so welcome to all of you. And a particular welcome, if I may, to Dr. Nina Anderson here. She's a medical student, a future psychiatrist, but she qualified as a doctor this afternoon. So this is her first one. Well done, Nina. <laughs> you really ought to be out drinking or something, Nina. You really should. You're going to fit in. That's all you've got to do. Right. So my hope for this brief inaugural is that um, I want to be just a little bit slightly unconventional from the normal way we do these things. So I'm going to start off with something from Twitter, named deliberately because um, it's a short burst of inconsequential information, which could indeed, that was indeed going to be the alternative title to this lecture before I changed it. <laughs> and my favourite though, one of the year, came earlier in this year, February the 1st, 2017, and it read this. It said, I have just woken up to find King George III is trending on Twitter. And I thought 2016 was a bit weird. <coughs> yep, because 200 years after his death, King George was indeed trending. Now the reason was that the night before, the BBC had shown a film, The Genius of the Mad King, a documentary on the project between the Royal Archives and here Kings uh, to digitalize all George's papers and correspondence, many of which had been previously unseen. Now people only know two things, or most people only know two things about King George. He lost his America and he went mad. Now the first may not actually be true. Uh, I mean, it's true that we lost America. Um, it may not be true that it was his fault. Although think of, thinking about it just now, I'm not entirely sure we'd want it back at the moment, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, who, who can say, who can say? And the second thing, well, he certainly did go mad, although opinions differ as to precisely why. But there's a third thing, which even the incredibly brilliant scholars who took part in that program, I think would have been uh, hard put to have named his third little known fact, is that George III created more Regis chairs than any other monarch before or since, 11 in total. Now, these weren't his idea. The uh, first Regis chair ever dates back to 1497, and that was the Regis chair of physic at the University of Aberdeen. It was created by the Scottish James IV with the specific uh, political intention of bringing the benefits of the Renaissance to the Scots. Um, Tony, you can tell us how that's going. <coughs> <laughs> um, but it wasn't until uh, 1540 that Henry VIII really got the show on the road with, by creating six Regis chairs at Oxford and Cambridge. One of them was John Story, his chair in civic law. And his own story, actually that pun wasn't intended, but uh, there we are. His own story wasn't a particularly happy one. 
He was an opponent of the Protestant Revolution, so he was persecuted under Edward VI, did very well under Mary, and very sensibly fled abroad to Flanders when Elizabeth I became queen. Unfortunately, he was kidnapped by her agents, brought back to London, and was then hung, drawn, and quartered. Um, and to think that uh, we moan about the way we assess research and teaching these <laughs> days. <laughs> Now, after George's record splurge, there was little appetite for any more, and the last one, in fact, was created in 1870, and there, indeed, the matter rested until the Queen's Diamond Jubilee in 2013. And as you've heard briefly, the uh, competition was held to create 10 new chairs in our non-ancient universities, i.e. all the rest of them, and every university put forward its best case, and King's decided, after an internal competition, to put forward psychiatry. Indeed, the other contender, um, I'm proud to say, was actually Michael Howard's old department of war studies, of which I'm a member. But fortunately, justice was done and we did win. <laughs> but it, that is also a fantastic department and it's changed my career here in, in almost as much as uh, belonging to the IOP has. So um, we decided that was the, the, the department and, and area would put forward, given the unique contribution that the Maudsley and IOPPN has made to our understanding of psychiatric, uh, psychiatry and mental health. We also noted that uh, should we be successful, the award would be on the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Maudsley. And you have to put that kind of thing in you know, to, to get the extra points. Now, it is very important to understand that the award is for all of us here. The, the, the um, bid was a collective effort by many people in this room, put together finally by Shatish Kapoor. But when I say this is something of which we can all be proud, this is not false modesty on my part. And my family who are here will tell you that I don't really do that. Um, but it is this time a statement of fact. The title is for kings. Now, I'm proud to be the first person to hold that chair, but the title belongs not to me at all, but to the institution and will be held by many more people in the years to come. So why did we succeed? Well, this is what we said in the introduction to our bid. It began with, by the end of the 19th century, mental illness was considered to be a matter of moral deficiency and shame. Sufferers were banished to asylums, and London alone had nearly 35,000 locked away. In that context of hopelessness, Henry Maudsley used his own funds to persuade the London County Council to try a new model a hospital where research and education would be embedded with care, where patients would be treated voluntarily and with an ambition to reintegrate them back into society. And it's remarkable to think that actually it wasn't until the Maudsley that it was possible to get any mental health care except as an involuntary patient. Now then, I've written here, others have already mentioned something of the achievements that we created over the last century and magnificent they have been. Unfortunately, others haven't mentioned that. Um, you can't get the warmer packs that you used to get, clearly not. But let me therefore almost might remember just some of them to you, which I thought they would be doing. But uh, this was the place that first objectified testing of, of intelligence. This was the place that first understood the neuropatholo neuropathology of epilepsy. We virtually invented psychiatric epidemiology here. We almost certainly did invent psychiatric genetics with the first MRC uh, center. We've um, developed CBT for numerous indications, including psychosis. And now, of course, we have the, the BRC, the NHR funded BRC for a translational medicine. We have an experimental medicine center from the Wellcome. Um, we have the first center for global mental health. We have the Wall Center for Neurosciences. And I apologize for all the others that I've forgotten. But those are the kind of achievements that we've done and continue to do. Now, what I want to go back to, though, is to go back on that word we used in the bid that we wrote uh, three years ago, where it mentioned something of the fact that before that had been this sense of hopelessness that Henry Maudsley set out to change. Because at the end of the 19th century, asylums hadn't really delivered the goods in terms of creating a new positive social environment in which moral therapy and isolation from the immoral consequences of the newly sprawling cities would of itself cure mental disorder. Not only had that not happened, it seemed to be going the other way. Things seemed to be getting worse. Cultural pessimism by the end of the century had taken over from the optimism at the beginning. By then, the Victorians believed in the concepts of degeneration. They believed that mental illness would inevitably decline from generation to generation and family to family. They weren't sure why, but they did think that sex and alcohol played a big part. And they weren't entirely wrong in that, because in fact what they were seeing was the rise of GPI, uh, which we now know to have been tertiary syphilis. 
um, and that would claim you know, the lives of Baudelaire, Maupassant, Nietzsche, Al Capone, many, many others. Now, they didn't know that, but they suspected there was some connection. And indeed, as soon as Amours was founded, it was Frederick Mott, again, missed out in the introduction, but he was one of those who showed the link between syphilis and GPI and led, of course, to the eradication of this. So it wasn't just so the psychoses they thought were getting worse. They believed that other less severe disorders were also on the increase. And chief amongst these was neurasthenia, nerve weakness, a mixture of what we now call chronic fatigue mixed in with the common mental disorders. But whatever it was, everyone agreed it was a new problem, that it was getting worse, and it was a threat to the nation's physical and mental health. And everybody had their own theory as to why. So, for example, George Beard, who had invented the term in 1880, in his book put forward five causes. And the first four causes were steam power, the newspapers, the telegraph. Actually, as I've just said that, it sounds like one's blaming the actual Daily <laughs> Telegraph for that, um, for the decline in all our physical and mental health, um, which actually, don't mind come to think of it, it's not such a bad, <laughs> such a bad idea. No, um, what he meant was the electric telegraph, the electric telegraph. And, and he um, claimed that all these were contributing by speeding up the pace of society. He said the businessman was constantly at the mercy of markets across the world, unable to sleep, never able to switch off. And of course, like any good scientist, he had statistics to prove it. In a few years, the number of messages sent by telegraph, the electric telegraph, had gone from zero to over 33 million. No wonder, he said, people's nervous systems were collapsing. How could anyone cope with this new flood of information and demands? Weir Mitchell, the most eminent neurologist of the day, simply said, life is now too fast, and invented the rest cure in order to address that balance. Now, I can see all of you thinking, well, they had a point, you know. Oh, yes, they had a point. It is like that. It's still like that, etc. But let me continue. I said to a five, his fifth cause will make us feel more uncomfortable, but this is what he said. The last causative factor was the excessive mental activity of women. Now, <laughs> now he, he, Beard was aware of the changes that were going on in the social role of women and the new opportunities that were coming to them in education and, and, and work. And clearly, he disapproved of this, and indeed said it was scientifically proven, scientifically proven, their temperament and nervous system were not suited for this. Now, he wasn't alone in this. Many, many eminent Victorians and experts said exactly the same. Over in France, a public health physician, Adrien Proust was his name, was one of the authorities on la neurasthenie, and he endorsed the same views. We say the French have a word for it, and indeed they did, surmenage, excessive mental activity. Very few people have heard of Adrien Proust, but everyone's heard of his son, the most famous neurasthenic of then or indeed any other age, the novelist Marcel. Is this a coincidence? Who can say? Now, subsequent writers have had a field day, and so they should, starting with contemporaries and right on to modern historians, cultural commentators, sociologists, etc., including many here, making the point that this alleged vulnerability of women to neurasthenia was not only not a scientific fact at all, it wasn't even a fact, and it was a reflection of the profound social and cultural concerns triggered by the changes in the role of women. Now, I use this slightly uncomfortable theme, but to make a point that I will repeat, that over the next generation, and indeed throughout the next hundred years, each generation always thinks that the previous one has never, had, whilst the previous one never had it so good, they are not having it good at all. And they point to an alleged rise in mental disorders as proof. And each generation links this, blames this, on a variety of social changes and concerns. Some of these have substance, others have none, or are closer to moral panics, as in Beard and Proust and the others' concerns about the role of women. Because the facts are also that mental disorders have actually remained remarkably stable over time. Now, how do we know? Well, I'm a clinical psychiatrist sometimes, but my academic background is in epidemiology, the study of populations loosely defined that I don't get out of bed for less than a thousand people. <laughs> but <coughs> good way of avoiding doing on calls, I tell you. But, um, but I doff my cap to the expert, the key expert in the field is in the audience, Sally McManus, because um, Sally masterminds something called the Adult Psychiatric Morbidity Study. This is an incredibly important study. It began in 1983. It interviews large random samples of the population about every seven years, providing us with the best source of data we have on mental health in this country, rates and trends. 
And as I said, for 40 years, the rates of all the main mental disorders have remained really fairly constant, remarkably so, despite all the social change of the period, until the fourth survey came out last year. Because now we did have a change, and it's a very specific change. Common mental disorders, depression, anxiety, have actually risen. But I say specific because it is. It's in a very specific age group, 18 to 24, although it's quite likely that when the child survey comes out next year, we'll see the same in, in uh, earlier ages as well. And it's a specific to one gender, to women. The prevalence in women um, was 19% seven years ago. It's now 26%. And in population terms, that's, believe me, that's a very substantial rise. Uh, it is just women. In men, it remains stable at 9%. Now, why? Well, if the rates have changed, one thing hasn't. Namely, that when it comes to changes in mental health, whether real or not, everyone has a culprit. So in the current case, for example, our Secretary of State is certain that social media is top of the list, and for lots of reasons. Online bullying, for example, it's not new, but amplified, inescapable from, by social media. Uh, how difficult it is to live in a world of constant scrutiny, comparison, measuring yourself against others, where peace and solitude and reflection is ever harder to find. It's indeed, one distinguished writer said, the greatest curse brought down on us by technology is that it prevents us from escaping from the present, even for a brief time. Absolutely right. Except that was Stefan Zweig, writing in the world of yesterday in 1942. The truth is, we don't really know why this change has happened. And that matters, because unless and until we can have some agreement as to why, deciding how to respond becomes problematic, especially given the checkered history of our profession with its highs, all of which took place here, as I have just said, <laughs> and its lows, none of which had anything to do with us at all, <laughs> as I've also said. But to be serious, sometimes our interventions, no matter how well-intentioned, were not only of little use, but have made things worse. Now that's of course true across medicine, and I would hazard a guess that actually our failures are nothing like as dangerous as some other specialities, and also that we have a rather good record in putting it right, especially here, where we have been, and I trust will always remain, certain to try and do the research first before we bring the interventions into play, and not the other way round. And never has that been more important than it is now. So, that's, I'll end my introduction by returning to my start, to tradition. And to one tradition that goes back even beyond 1497 and the Scots. And that's the tradition of, indeed, the inaugural lecture. Now that began for the most prosaic reasons, money. The medieval university did not pay its professors. Actually, Ed, you just laughed there, didn't you? You're thinking, that's, I just heard him laugh. Said, that's a good idea. Yes. Gosh, we should re bring that back. Excellent. Yes. Oh dear, no. Anyway, what happened was the inaugural lecture was a piece of advertising. The students would, if they liked you, they would then sign up or whatever they did, I don't know, to, to join you or to become taught by you or attend your lectures and they would pay you afterwards. In other words, imagine the horror, students having to pay, pay for their own tuition. Thank God we put that quaint medieval tradition long behind us. <coughs> but anyway, traditions are to be broken and I'm going to stop now only half time, but I am, and instead invite our panel, please, to take to the stage so we can get theirs, and if we have time, yours as well, views as to why things have changed in this one particular specific area of mental disorders in young people. So can I ask to come to the stage in alphabetical order indeed, Professor Louise Arsenault? Louise, where are you? Oh, you're all there, okay. So Louise is the Professor of Developmental Psychology <laughs> here at KCL and the ESRC Mental Health Leadership Fellowship, and hopefully you'll hear an expert in many of the things we're talking about. And can I have Paul Farmer? Paul is the head of mind, he's the mastermind of the Five Year Forward View, and indeed, Paul and I have spent so much time together last year that as the song goes, people will say we're in love. <laughs> and now, sadly, I'm not able to, oh, I'm sorry, I've got the, got the things wrong here. Um, we also have Tessa Harrison, so Tessa is the Director of Students in Education here at King's, and she's Chair of the Association of University Administrators. And uh, we were hoping to welcome Hannah Jane Parkinson, who's the Guardian writer on many things, including mental health, politics, football, etc., who won the Young Commentator Award and is an absolutely brilliant journalist. Unfortunately, Hannah is actually unwell at the moment and can't come. And so her look-alike, we've uh, just picked on only a couple of minutes ago, is uh, Dr. Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet. <laughs> <who is> <laughs> <laughs> so 
he will take all the questions that were on, and can I just repeat what Hannah is there to cover? She, according to her profile, she's on pop culture, music, <laughs> tech, football, politics, and mental health. So all those will be for you, Richard. <laughs> Good. Thank you. <laughs> you got that one, yeah. Okay, folks, good. So, um, how, sh how should we kick off? I mean, that, that's the really easy one. I mean, I think we're going to take it for granted that no one knows the answer to why we've seen this change. There isn't going to be a single answer. But you're all allowed to put forward what you think might be one of the more plausible causes. So, if I start with you, Paul. Uh, uh, well, first of all, uh, it's definitely not the form of Chelsea <laughs> uh, who is responsible for, the, uh, for, for any of this. Um, I, I think, well, I think you could argue, uh, I suppose our initial argument has got to be uh, why, what is it about this cohort that means that they are appearing to be in need of greater levels of treatment than, uh, than, than, these, than other cohorts have. So the, a theory has to be that uh, they haven't get, had the right help and support in the years leading up to this age group. Now, of course, we won't yet know whether that's true until we see the results of the uh, child survey equivalent. Um, but I think we need to certainly ask a question about the extent to which we're getting the right kind of help and support to young people with emerging mental health problems. And is this the inevitable consequence of a, a long-term inability to provide the right kind of help and support to uh, young, young people? And we do know from the work we did on the five-year forward view that uh, a reasonable estimate would be that something like only one in four young people are getting access to the right kind of help and support. Uh, the investment of the five-year view will take us to a magnificent one in three, but that still uh, would suggest that there are a lot of people whose uh, mental, poor mental health is going unsupported and untreated. So there you are. There's my... The, the first theory of possibility, while this particular age group seems to be experiencing more problems because they're just not getting help at a younger age. Okay. Tessa. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know why. I, do I get nerves. Go on, yeah. That's fine. Um, so I, I uh, just scribbled a few thoughts down and I'd just like to, uh, to read them through. So King's in its vision 2029 has, has made an explicit commitment to caring uh, about each other. And I think this is something we, we need to think about and uh, reflect on. I've recently found out that my very own sister has been having quite intensive uh, psychiatric support for a number of years and I didn't know. Um, and I'm the mother of, of an 18 year old son who's just started his first year at university. And I think for me, this has now started to become about paying attention and noticing each other. Um, I'm seeing the demand from our students for mental health services and demand in my professional life for coaching and mentoring uh, support as a demand to be listened to. So for me, we've all become too busy, too self-absorbed, your point about it's all busy, busy, to notice the person in front of us, whether that's our sister, our son, or our colleagues. Um, we think we know each other, but you know what, we don't. Um, we think we're listening, but we're not. So we're complex, we're bringing to Kings, in this case, uh, a whole set of experiences, learned behaviors, assumptions. Really communicating what we really mean is hard, and listening without judgment is difficult. But we are more resilient than I think we often uh, give ourselves credit for, and we are actually also more resourceful. Um, and sometimes just the space for somebody to actually talk to and really listen to us is often all that's needed and I, I really do think this is uh, there's, there's something in here and we can all learn how to listen better we can learn how to suspend judgment when we're talking with somebody <coughs> and we can learn how to recognize the signals in everybody when they're finding it hard to say what it is they want to say uh, how to express themselves I don't think we know why we're seeing the increase that we've seen uh, in student mental health issues. We know this is a sector-wide issue across the globe. Um, we have a unique opportunity here at King's to bring together student services, our students, and of course the IOPPN to answer that question. Why is this happening and what, what do we need to do about it? I want the King's community to live the commitment in the vision to care for each other. I want that to be about noticing each other 
uh, about working from the basis that you may think you know me, but you don't. My sister, my son, and the students I spoke to in terms of preparing for this, I said, what do you want me to say to this community of uh, experts? I'm not an expert. Uh, and they said, be human. Um, tell them that feelings are facts, and tell them, work with me at my own pace. So if you're in front of me, you're pulling me. If you're behind me, you're pushing me. But if you're beside me, listening to me, then you're supporting and guiding me. And I think that's quite important. Okay, thank you. Louise. So I thought I would uh, bring a developmental perspective to this issue, given that I'm a professor of developmental psychology, and also maybe some so social science, given I'm a representative of the ESRC, Mental Health Leadership Fellow. Um, and first I wanted to remind people that 75% of people with mental disorders have been uh, receive a diagnosis before the age of 18, and 50% of them have received a diagnosis before the age of 15. So those students, who have mental health problems, who find it difficult when they reach university, quite often they already had mental health problems before they reach that stage. I also want to remind people that before becoming students, they were pupils at schools. And that brings me to the notion of bullying. You mentioned bullying, and I thought I had to mention the word bullying. But I would argue with you why I don't think that bullying is part of this increase in mental health among students. For two specific um, reasons, first of all, um, I don't think that there's been an increase in bullying. There's definitely been an increase in awareness and uh, acknowledgement of bullying and its impact on mental health problem. But if we looked at the National Child Development Study, rates of bullying in the late 60s is about the same as the rate of bullying victimization <coughs> in a cohort that we have here in the early um, um, 2000s. So I don't think that there's been an increase in, in bullying. Some of you may say, Oh yes, but uh, what about cyberbullying, which is so uh, common and prevalent these days? If we look at the impact of cyberbullying in relation to mental health problem, it doesn't have any impa independent impact on mental health problem when you consider other forms of victimization. So I would be very careful about, you know, before blaming new technologies and social media for the rise of mental health problems in young students. But uh, what I would want to bring up to the table would be loneliness. So um, we talk a lot about loneliness in the um, elderly, but actually the group of people who suffer the most from loneliness, as a report, um, uh, reported by the Mental Health Foundation, is actually between the, the group of between 18 and 34 years old. And that captures exactly the population that we are talking about. Um, when you think that this group is going through a, a massive transition from going from home to going to university, most of them have lost completely their social network and they are challenged. They are being pushed, uh, they are being, you know, as you said, pushed and pulled. Um, it's really important that they find their bearing and developing a new kind of social network. And I think that some of them are not equipped to be able to develop that social network maybe because how we relate to people is different these days. We get in touch via you know, WhatsApp or we meet people on a dating web website. So the way that we interact with each other has changed and we need to make sure that um, we teach our children how to make friends, how to be a friend and how to maintain <coughs> friendships. I don't know, they seem to do that quite well, don't they? I mean, you know, I, I wish we had all that when I was at university. I had a much happier time. And you just go and look at the pubs and bars and clubs of London, most of which my children seem to live in. Yes. They seem to be doing much better than we did. I'm not sure, actually. No? No. Yeah. They would say social media is a good thing for them. It's well, I them think, to expand those social networks. Yeah, I think that you expand your social network with people that you've never met face to face but you kind of are in touch with them via you know, your mobile. So it's good to keep in touch, I think. So people that you know already, it's very good for keeping in touch, but I'm not sure whether it's good to make a new relationship. Okay. Or those relationships are not necessarily kind of meaningful when you're being challenged and pushed and pulled. 
Okay. Now, Hannah was here, as you know, to cover football, so do you favour the, uh, <laughs> the three well, first, at the back? Or? Well, first, first of all, <laughs> congratulations to Kings. Um, <laughs> congratulations to you. So this means now we never have to publish another paper from you. Because <laughs> now you're the king. You're the king. Well, you don't have any more achievements to make, so no, no more papers from Wesley S. et al. For ever, ever again. Fortunately, um, there's so many Lancers now. We I can know, put them anywhere. I know, I know. Yeah. We've got, we got Lancers and Poetry. Yeah. Now... Um, let me answer this. Um, you've all got thousands of pieces of paper here, I and know, I haven't prepared. I so um, <laughs> let me try and answer this um, a slightly different way. So in 2003, we published our first global health series on child survival. And um, back then, the only thing that, was, that mattered was that something like uh, 12 uh, million children under five were dying of largely preventable cause. We've ha halved that um, within 15 years. It's an incredible achievement. Uh, and back in 2003, nobody ever, and I was, I was there at the birth of this movement, nobody ever talked about the idea of the adolescent, the young person. Um, and during the past 15 years, there's been something quite revolutionary that's taken place, I think, in the way we, we think about health. And that is, it's the birth of the adolescent. It's a remarkable change just within a generation to think that this 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 thing that we never used to talk about, the adolescent, broadly defined, we did a commission on adolescent health led by George Patton and Susan Sawyer just over a year ago, and they defined the adolescent um, going into the young person as the age of 10 through 24. Uh, and that age group is, is such a neglected entity in our entire health landscape, not just globally, but even, even in this country, although we're beginning to recognize it. So, when we talk about mental health issues in young people, I want to expand it a little bit because it's not just mental health issues, it's also physical health issues. In fact, the whole constellation of the health of the young person is an area that is massively marginalised in our society. And just as we've understood that there's no point in saving children's lives unless you think about early child development, so I think we're now beginning to understand that if you don't get this period, 10 to 24, right, the entire trajectory of a human, be human being's life, it's not just about not fulfilling your potential, but there is something that will go tragically wrong if we miss this window of opportunity. People like Russell Viner and others, and you have a Centre for Adolescent Psychiatry here, are doing an immensely important work in bringing this to the attention of our policymakers and politicians, but still it's not enough and we have to do a lot more to place the adolescent, the young person, at the centre of our thinking about the future of our society. Because if we don't get that right, then quite literally our society is going to be going into a very troubled time. That was very good, Richard, for someone who hasn't <laughs> even practised what I think you've probably said some of that before. But you still didn't quite say, why is that different? Why is that different from a generation previously? Because the adolescent, quite simply, that period of life from, uh, the, from the age of 10 to 24 was a very different period in terms of the opportunities, the pressures that that person was enduring, the, phys the, the risk of injuries, the risk of substance use, alcohol use, uh, harmful disorders, uh, the pressures on the, a whole constellation of issues which mm. are different today than they were, for example, in my generation. I don't want to put it down to one particular no. thing, social media, True. but I think it's the complexity of the environment at that time that is very, very different today. And, and yet, alcohol and drug use is going down. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Louise. Yeah. <laughs> you know about these things. Well, maybe so. because they don't have anyone to go for a drink. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they feel lonely, so they don't... You know, they cannot go to have a drink with their tablet or their mobile phones. <laughs> Maybe. Paul? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, th I think I've got, like everybody on this panel, probably we have a young, young teenage mm, son yeah, who yeah. is in this space, and the, the risk is uh, you always fall into the, you know, the, the, uh, the joy of the anecdote, don't you? Yeah. But, uh, so I'm just about to give you two just yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I thought you were. Yeah. I, I, I think you, uh, I, do, I think there are, you know, there are three pointers that you, you, we do need to think, think about. So the, you know, if, if we were playing QI and we were asking this question, we've already hit the first one, which is social media, yep. good or evil. Yeah. And I think the, you know, to, for many people, I think the answer here is net neutral. Some good, some bad. And, and I, I, think, I think a lot of people, actually, we know that a lot of people find 
uh, the social, their social media platforms as a place to be very open about their own personal mental health in a way that they would never have previously been done in a face-to-face -face setting with their friend. But we equally know that social media can be a horrible force for uh, ill uh, and particularly on the on the bullying side. So I would go I would go net neutral on uh, on on social media. Um, uh, I th the, the, the issue we haven't yet talked about is stigma. Uh, so uh, there's a con there's an interesting issue emerging I think here. So we do know that this is an age group where broadly speaking um, attitudes towards mental health and poor mental health uh, are improving. So there is a greater degree of um, uh, kind of uh, openness to talking more openly about mental health problems amongst this particular age cohort. So, uh, so that might lead somebody, that might lead you to say, Simon, at this point, ah, does that mean that stigma is actually a bad thing because it's increasing the, the prevalence of people's uh, poor mental health? Now, I think, uh, you know, I, I think we are in an age now where the conversations that we're having about mental health is at a level we've never seen before, both publicly and privately. But I would uh, agree that one of the big challenges is then is how do we equip ourselves to have that are you okay conversation and be prepared to accept that the answer is no. Uh, because for far too many occasions in our great, uh, you know, in great establishments like this, I'm sure millions of times a day we will walk past each other and say, how are you, I'm fine. One answer, end of story. Um, and we have to equip our young people to be able to cope with the answer from your friend being no, but we also, in a, and if we're talking about the academic environment or the university environment, we have to equip uh, the, uh, university lecturers, university staff to be able to cope with their own, uh, with, with they, their uh, students uh, giving us that answer. And I think the support for staff is hugely important. And finally, in this environment, we do have to remind ourselves that the staff themselves have to look after their own mental health. And I think if there is one area where, unfortunately, we have failed miserably, and this is where I can declare an interest in so far as my wife is an academic and tells me constant, not her kings, I hasten to add, uh, um, but a place up the road. Um, uh, she tells me how terrible the mental health of the staff is and how uh, poorly supported staff are. So if you're not creating a mentally healthy community, a mentally healthy environment where uh, people can feel open about talking about their experiences, then actually this situation will get worse. Yeah, and we, we could say the same in the NHS. My wife is in the audience and she would say that. That's why I'm not going to ask her to. Uh, but that's exactly what, what she would say. But I mean, we're just, I mean, we're in a, we're entering the election where everyone's got a manifesto and I got elected three years ago and I wrote a manifesto and I only put one thing in it that I would do, which was go to every single medical school, not knowing there were 34 of them. Uh, who knew? Who knew? The one in Lancaster, who knew that? Anyway, um, so, um, so, and, but there you talk to, so I've talked to 34 different groups of mainly medical, but not just, a lot of other students come along knowing that you're a psychiatrist. And there is certainly a real change to what it was like when we started um, in socially conscious people wanting to talk about mental health, sometimes very clearly, sometimes less clearly. But there is this really very, very palpable change. And yet, still, we are having difficulties in recruiting into mental health nursing, recruiting into psychiatry, recruiting into things. So we haven't really harnessed that energy and enthusiasm into going into a career into this, which is what we would like people to do and to come to places like this. Well, what are we doing wrong? Well, first of all, I don't think we're doing it together enough. I mean, you know, yeah. you've done a fantastic job. <laughs> you know, the uh, Network Rail will be very grateful to you yeah. for, and will miss your train, train, train fares. Yeah, but, that's true. But, <laughs> yeah, and you've probably single-handedly had an impact on the number of people who are applying for psychiatry in the last oh, year wow. because mm. not many other presidents of Royal Colleges would have gone and done that. So, you know, credit to you for that. But I don't think we're doing enough together to uh, c persuade people that this, this area of mental health is a fabulously interesting, exciting and challenging place to come and work. And we do have to send positive messages and we sometimes ourselves are guilty of talking, of talking down our world of mental health yeah. and saying how it can be, sometimes it's difficult and challenging and it is. But it is also the place that I think you know, is the biggest challenge for this generation. And if this data tells us anything, it is that we have to focus on prioritising <laughs> mental health and future governments, whichever government might, might be in the future, needs to be putting mental health at the heart of its policy thinking, not on the periphery. 
Now, uh, as I was thinking about the, uh, you know, the really august history uh, from your, your lecture and also from of, of this place, and our organisation, MIND, is seven, just over 70 years old this year, formed by the government of the day, just after the Second World War, forced together three organisations, one called the National Institute of Mental Hygiene, uh, it tells you everything you need to know, it was, but it was worried about the psychological state of the country. Hello. Um, so here is an opportunity to do that actually once again. Um, and uh, we, need more, we need more help from colleagues to get that right. We need to encourage young people to come and work in mental health. Uh, but we also need to talk up what we're doing uh, in terms of this change. Because, because this, the next generation uh, are desperately need the right help and support from, them, from a future workforce. Okay. So la last question to the panel then. So... <coughs> Well, just think of one thing we'd like to do, and, and I'm going to make one stipulation that it doesn't involve money, okay? So it's like, you know, Lord Rutherford famously said, uh, we have no more money, well, I'm afraid we're going to have to think. So, and that's pretty true, actually. So not bringing in lots and lots more people to do than the other. What would you do? Let's start with you, Tessa. What would you do that actually doesn't involve more people, more money? I think what I would do, because we have the resources here, is equip colleagues how to listen. So our students tell us over and over again, please stop listening to what I'm saying and think that you have to provide the answers. I think I probably know what the answers are, but I need some help in articulating them. So I think very easily you could set up a, a very inexpensive, cheap way of just buddying uh, students and staff up to learn how to listen to each other. Okay. We'll come and to in you fact, last. we're doing it a little bit, and we can do it more. Okay, we'll come to you last, Richard, just because you've had no time to think about any of this. So, Louise. Um, I think I would put my uh, prevention cap, so I think I would forget about the cohort now. I would uh, make sure that young children um, do get the skills, either thought at schools or by their parents, so that doesn't involve any money, um, but they know how to make friends, they know how to be a friend, and they know how to maintain friendships. Okay. Paul? Well, those, I completely agree with those. I, I would require, uh, I'd ask all uh, uh, few major employers to, uh, to require their, um, uh, their to, 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 to be able to have inside their, their graduate training program a really robust mental well-being, uh, well-being program. Okay. which I don't think will cost them any money, any more money than they're currently spending on their health and safety budget. And you happen to be heading a commission that may, that may well be its conclusion. I'm just guessing there. <laughs> okay, fair <Possibly> enough. <laughs> Richard. Uh, well, well, I think well, one, one thing would I do... The, the future for me, um, if we look at it from a, a, a perspective of a, of a health system, is <coughs> primary care. Um, we can't deliver effective mental health services um, unless we invest in our primary care system. As fantastic as this place is, and I, of course it is, um, this is not the solution to uh, providing effective mental health uh, support teams in the community. And so what I would like to see is an investment in our primary care system. I'm not just talking about general practitioners, and pr practitioners I'm talking across the whole range of different health professionals, including nurses, including midwives, um, so that we build up an incredibly strong infrastructure uh, for that mental health service provision. And we don't talk enough about the effect arm of mental health services lying uh, within primary care. So okay. great, this is a great place, but I want primary care to be even stronger than it is. Now, I have to agree with you, otherwise I'm sleeping in the spare room. As you <laughs> <are now. laughs> but fortunately, I do. Okay. <laughs> fortunately, I do. You're absolutely right. I think it was me. I mean... If it's true what you say about loneliness and its social networks, I, I would, uh, our first thing I think would be to push that at university. It would be mm. to push not bringing in professionals mm. like us, but to push things like volunteering, mm. uh, peer support, sport, cool. music, all those things yeah, that increase one, your social There's one other thing actually on that. I can remember a few years ago I was involved with a uh, report from the Royal College of Physicians on medical professionalism. And we took it around the country uh, in lots of different places talking about the meaning of professionalism. And I remember to this day, there's one conversation with this newly qualified doctor, and she, she, she'd come out incredibly passionate about what she was doing, and then she'd hit the reality of the NHS. 
And she had other friends who were doing other professions and other different jo jobs. And she said, you know, the thing that, that they get, which I don't get, and she used this very specific word, they're cherished. And she didn't feel that as a newly qualified doctor, she came into this fantastic system that's, you know, full of idealism. Um, but she didn't feel like she was cherished as part of the system. She felt like a little cog, a little widget in this enormous machine. Um, and nobody really took care of her um, and her idealism, her passion. And I was at a meeting at the London School of Hygiene just a week ago, and there was a young public health uh, doctor who'd gone to work in a local authority, passionate about public health, and she said that after six months, her passion had been drained and she'd left public health. There's something wrong with the way we look after each other. We have to do a better job of looking after each other, taking care of each other, helping, supporting, motivating, mobilizing each other. And we don't do that well. We're very good about telling other people to do it. We're very good about criticizing government for what they're not doing. But we're very bad at looking at what we do or what we don't do. So please, can we look after each other a little bit better? <laughs> Nina, don't listen to him. He's completely wrong. No. no, you're not. So we allowed you to overrun a bit because we did spring this on you. So now I have to now thank all you. Thank you so much thank for you. coming and uh, well done. And uh, particularly Richard, but thank everyone you. else as well. Thank, thank you. you. And I have a couple of minutes which I can sum up, which I can't really at all. But I suppose. If I'm going to sum up what we've today, we, we, we have received the honour, and it is an honour, of being the first university. And it's great. We are the first university. We've beaten those godless heathens to the north of us that we've already heard about um, to hold a, a Regis chair in psychiatry. And our 100-year record is, as we've said, it's about redefining mental illness, its treatment and place in society. But Richard and everyone else made it very clear that this is very much unfinished business. And I'd like to think this institution has always led from the front in this area, be it developing and using new research technologies, improving psychological treatments, translating research into clinical practice. We've also led on new partnerships, users and carers in particular, responded to new social challenges, the closing of the silence and the switch to community care. And now I would like to think we will respond to the rise in mental health problems in young people. Now, we are committed, you've heard very clearly, to um, being the best we can possibly be in supporting the health and well-being of our students. But obviously, we're not alone in that. I said I've been to 34 medical schools. If I'd been to all 100 and however many it is, 135 universities in this country, I very much doubt there'd be any university <coughs> whose goal was to ignore this and say, we're not going to do that. We don't care about the well-being of our students. I think that would be a very unlikely thing to happen. So I think though our uniqueness is to go one step further and to do more, not just responding to the issues, but to also define it and change it. Why has it happened? How can we change it, not just here, but nationally and even internationally by carrying out research, providing innovation and shaping policy? In other words, doing exactly what we've done for the last hundred years and done very well. And that's why we, and I mean we, have been awarded this Regis Chair. So my last act is to thank you for coming, but in particular now I hand over to Robert. Robert, you will end the proceedings. Thank you. So it's my uh, pr pleasure and privilege to wrap things up, and in so doing, I'm going to put the spotlight um, very much onto the man <laughs> in the middle, uh, the man of the okay. occasion. So when we were, we discovered that we had been successful with our bid um, for this uh, great honour of having a Regis Chair. Of course, we then turned our minds and our attention to what the key characteristics would be uh, of the first appointee and what we would expect of them. So I'm going to mention five things very briefly, and I ask you with me just to reflect on whether or not actually we're happy that <laughs> Sir Simon <laughs> fits the bill. Oh, good. <laughs> so the first and most obvious thing is that we wanted to appoint an academic psychiatrist of international distinction. 
Now, Simon, I think you uh, passed that test with flying colours. Ed spoke earlier of your outputs. Your H index, for those of you who know about these things, is up in the rafters. Uh, you've had a major impact on our understanding of chronic fatigue, PTSD, military health, and many other things besides. So your international renown uh, is absolutely intact. And the second thing we wanted was someone who would be a really powerful ambassador uh, for psychiatry, both nationally and internationally. And again, I can't think of anybody who would be more effective, more outspoken in a positive way, uh, and more courageous uh, and more persuasive as an ambassador for your subject. It's something you've been doing brilliantly in your college uh, presidential role, and we hope you'll continue in this role. The third quality that we wanted was someone who would be an attractor into this discipline, this specialty. Um, and that's something that I know, I've known you for a while, you have been passionate about doing over the years and indeed successful uh, in doing. You exude pheromones from every pore. Um, if, if, if I had fallen under your spell when I was uh, a young doctor, I might even have done psychiatry myself. So uh, that undoubtedly, again, uh, you passed that test with flying colours. In terms of two things that um, I think we wanted you to help deliver, the first is something that I know is dear to your heart, uh, and that is to lay to bed, or lay to rest rather, Cartesian dualism. Now, you're such an erudite audience, I know you'll know your philosophy, and Descartes it was uh, who was wedded to the dualism of the mind and the body. Uh, and it's a distinguishing feature of our own Academic Health Science Centre here, King's Health Partners, of which the Maudsley is a major player, that we do integrate much more effectively what we should have done for so long before, mental and physical health care, because the mind and the body are so deeply interwoven uh, and one and the same thing. So you've been a champion of that, um, and I hope that you'll continue um, to put the final nail in Cartesian dualism's coffin. And then the final thing that we uh, wished you to do was to make us national and international leaders in addressing our student mental health issues. And tonight is a very good illustration of your passion and commitment to that. Uh, it's a huge challenge, one that I think we're all up for working with you on, uh, but in your Regis professorship, um, I hope that you'll continue to champion that cause and help us to do innovative things, which we've been discussing tonight. So when you put all that together, I've just come back from the States, so allow an American analogy. I think we've scored a home run uh, in appointing you. Uh, I think you're absolutely the right person, and I can't think of a better one uh, on the planet. And all of that comes, of course, with a very generous helping uh, of wit and charm. <laughs> and any of you that know Simon, you've seen it tonight, uh, you'll see that that is absolutely true. So our expectations of you are high. Um, however, your abilities mean that those won't only be met, but I suspect they'll be far exceeded. So can I thank you very much for this evening, uh, for getting this fantastic audience together, um, and invite everybody to go into the Robin Murray uh, uh, space to enjoy a well-deserved drink. Thank you.